India dances to the rhythms of million rural feet. All over India, without formal training in dance, unaware of classical traditions, mostly unlettered and totally unfettered, the innocent dancers of the villages of India bring to all of us the vast spectrum of folk and tribal and ritual forms. There is no reason for the dance except a desire to celebrate life. Unlike dancers, rigorously gloomed in classical genres, the folk dancers have no agenda of attaining glory or greatness, name or fame, awards or rewards, no experience of commendations or adulations. They dance because they are meant to dance. Like most folk cultures around the world, the folk traditions of India too encompass a great variety of occasions and events to celebrate. Farmers and agricultural workers practically have a dance to welcome every seasonal change. They dance with joyous abandon to create for themselves the raison d'etre or the reason, a reinstatement of the beliefs rooted in mythology of the land and culture. Nothing is for effect. The dance is not staged. It has no formal platform except for the vast scenic surroundings they live in. They believe that their dance is a kind of prayer to Mother Nature and its gods, a prayer that invokes and propitiates as well as gives thanks. They dance not for an audience but for themselves. The folk dancers and tribal dancers comprise a large segment of India's population which otherwise has no connection or background in dancing. Hard working and not very affluent, the rural folk form the nucleus of the village economy and in their everyday lives they weave a tapestry of song and dance at birth and death, marriage and festivals. It is said that for such a large country as India, there are far too few classical dance forms. True, but this paucity is easily offset by the abundant variety of folk dances in virtually all nooks and crannies of the country. There are over a hundred forms of folk dances in India with regional variations. Everywhere, ranging from hamlets tucked into the rugged Himalayan foothills in the north, the lush plains of the Gangetic belt, the estuaries of the east, the valleys of the west, and the riverbanks of the south, folk dancing takes place throughout the year. It needs no promotion or projection. It is simply a happy, vigorous ode to life and living. In independent India, there has been large-scale migration of people from the villages to the cities. Urbanization has brought the erstwhile villagers to cityscapes where they have to struggle and get to deal with city glamour. Consumerism, the rat race, educational degrees, politics, cinema and television. These urban influences are steadily seeping into Indian villages, alienating the simple folk from their traditional moorings while often doing nothing to improve their quality of life in terms of basic needs. But in the process, the rest of the country has come to know of these innocent rustic people to whom dance is not an act of public performance but a part of life itself. In the folk dances lies India's traditional essence. While folk dances are full of spontaneity and freedom and convey an impression of unfettered primordial vitality, they are not performed anytime or anywhere. A suitable occasion and an equally appropriate setting are always considered important as per norms. Though unwritten, these norms are nevertheless followed by tradition and practice. Thus, the free will that seems so powerful an element of folk forms exists only within the overall framework of the dancer's social obligations and custom-bound daily lives. The underlying emotion in all such dances is spiritual joy. Another important aspect is love and its expression through courtship dancing. This type of dance does not connote sexual license, although it certainly allows a free mixing of the two sexes. Songs that convey either heroism or love are common and a part of the everyday lore of these villagers. 
these songs find a physical expression in dance. Collective dancing, get-togethers, large-scale celebrations and festivities also help to nurture community feeling and friendship. As the dancers are mostly agrarian or pastoral people, they have rights. They have evolved through centuries connected with all events that have significance in the calendar like harvesting, sowing, reaping, rains and other seasonal changes. These rites include dances in which either nature or the pods are thanked for making these events possible or the events themselves are portrayed symbolically. Naturally activities like planting and winnowing are a part and parcel of the dance depictions. While most of the dancing takes place in the open, certain ritual dances do call for a special setting. For example, a shrine or a backdrop and props of totemic value, a place consecrated to any mystic or tribal deities as well as masks, paintings and totems are necessary in ritual dances. In established ancient cultures, dance is akin to prayer and this is quite true of Indian folk dances too. Dancing is a means of communication with the divinities. At the far end of the spectrum are the performers who are invested with special powers or enjoy hereditary rights to perform certain ceremonies or dances. Shamans and magicians too project their art or vision through these dances. A few dances are meant to ward off evil spirits. Often such dances are frenzied with the performers apparently becoming possessed. Our rich and varied folk forms that have continued to be performed in rural setting basically to celebrate seasons or harvest. Seen only on festive or harvest occasions in its own settings, these forms from Rauf of Kashmir to Kavri of Kanyakumari tell us the richness of rural India. From Giddha of Punjab to Garba of Gujarat, but there too films and its version of folk dance are making inroads because the television has reached the remotest corner of India, leveling out trends and traditions. Costumes have undergone change and one sees the senseless tinsel and synthetic textiles replace cultural symbols connected to weaving, seasons and Mother Earth. Martial and royal dances like the Chau, Sarekala in Bihar, originally part of Orissa, Mayurbhanj from Orissa and Purulia from Bengal have always been performed and taught by men. Ditto Kathakali, Krishnatam, Kodiyatam from Kerala. Kujipuri was originally an all-male form like Kathakali still is. Thus male dance and dancers did matter. These forms continue to be performed regularly in rural settings. The robust film industry both in Mumbai and Madras or Chennai, as it is called presently, and many other metros like Hyderabad, the film city there, which is India's biggest outdoor studio called Ramaji Rao, or like in Delhi, the Noida region, NCR, and small town India offer a veritable feast of dance over the years. Dance masters, choreographers, and artists have provided much material or fodder for popular consumption. This genre, in truly Indian, there is no description for it, though in last 10 years, gymnastics have replaced true dancing abilities as most film actors have not the possible time for proper training in a classical form. Thus, group works and gymnastics and something that is easy to do is undertaken. India is the world's largest film producing country and amongst the few which have song and dance that you always hear and see when you see a film. Thus, many dancers, choreographers, costume designers and makers, makeup artists get employment in this way too. Dance thus permeates all aspects of our society and the films are no insignificant and are a tool of popular and mass outreach. Many famous dancers became film stars like Kamala, Vajanti Mala, Hema Malini, Sri Devi and Minakshi Shishadri. Some dancers acted in dance films like Devi Karani, Sitara Devi, Roshan Kumari. She was in Satyajit Ray's Jal Saghar. The list of dancer stars and dance star dancers is too long to mention here, but a cursory search can show the extent. The spin-off 
of film as mass media is best reflected now through the invasion of the cable television and in the last few decades an abundance of dance related TV shows. While Puritans may debunk Boogie Woogie as precursor of bad taste in dance and thereby ruining a whole generation of young Indians, the sheer ratings and survival of the show has ensured several copies, each more glamorous and opulent. Nach Balie, Aja Nachale, Dancing Queen, suddenly the studios of Mumbai churning out these competitions makes one feel that the whole nation is suddenly dancing. In some ways, thanks to these shows, Indians have loosened up a bit and feel less conscious of their bodies. Thanks to these shows and dance is no more a reserved, preserved or dirty word. The dance bars of Bombay also provided employment to out-of-work cabaret artists who may be waiting to get foothold in the film industry. The success of school-level gymnastic salsa combine of Shamak Dawa types has spurned several spurious copycats as far as Delhi and Kolkata. Dance has become health related and the Vandanas and Chandanas of the world are in cashing on this trend by offering loose weight through dance and maybe a distant and desi cousin of Jane Fonda has been found right here in India. Indian dance today remains at an interesting crossroad. Classical traditions have less takers both in audience and by way of sponsors support and modern dance has come of age. India's best export item, Nataraja, the Lord of Dance, wonders why a country with a continuous links with its past needs to break away just to be new. This is also a question that concerns dancers, historians and critics. From this month and churning, surely something new and magnificent should emerge as response to our times. Modern dance in India is just a contemporary response to tradition. Unlike in America, which created a genre of modern dance largely because it had no history or tradition of classical ballet, as it was the case in Europe, there was classical ballet, India does not have modern dance. What does that mean? It means just as we need alphabets, like I speak, to make a word, to form a sentence that makes sense or meaning. In dance also, we need words, alphabets, grammar, structure, comprising of units, movements, postures to make sense or convey a meaning. In that sense, only three dancers or so in the last many decades have succeeded in creating something new, not based on classical forms alone, but away from it. We can think in the 1960s of Uttara Kurlawala of Mumbai, now settled in USA. She did pioneering modern dance in that period of 60s and 1970s. Her example inspired Astad Tebu, also settled in Mumbai, who continues the mold of modern dance for many, many decades. And now we see younger talents in modern dance who have truly evolved a language like Daksha Seth, living in Trivandrum, Kerala, and her daughter Isha, who has also now gone to films, and a group from Bangalore of Mayuri, Madhuri, Upadhyay called Nritya Ritya. These few people have created something beyond tradition, not using classical forms alone, but trying to get a vocabulary and grammar that is Indian and modern. Madras remains traditional and has very little to offer in modern dance. Narendra Kumar tries to some type of modern dance but end result is Bharatanatyam. No matter how much they wish to escape and go far, they can't. It's in the DNA, this Bharatanatyam stuff. Legs bend at knees automatically, exaggerated Kathakali gestures come and lo and behold, a modern dance production looks like same old Bharatanatyam production. Anita Ratnam does dance theatre with heavy en emphasis on costumes that look rich, music that sounds detailed and dance that's minimal. Yet she's trying to offer a new way. 
Art Gallery of Bangalore, heavily funded by many agencies, is trying to find a path, though heavily Western influence and sensibilities don't make it look like they have anything uniquely Indian to offer yet. Smattering of training in Kalari or Kathakali does not necessarily lead to anything exceptionally modern. Dependence on technology and stage props shows that Kalari types of groups are still in infancy. Small town India follows Big Brother, the metros. Mysore has some Vande Matram number going on without by your leave to composer, singer A.R. Rahman. Themes are predictable and stuff similar. Chandigarh, Kanpur, Cochin, what have you, Tutikor and Trivandrum. Modern dance means film sequence at best. Some hashed up Indian styles at worst. Who then do we have as nationally known talents from among many more solo artists? Less than 10. Delhi, two maybe, Navte Johar and Santosh Naya. Chennai, three maybe, Srikant, Ranjit and Narendra. Bhubaneswar 5, Rahul Acharya, Lingraj Pradhan, Prabhata, Mulya and Debrata. Bangalore 9, Satya, Praveen, Sheshadri, Murli, Tushar, Pasunath, Swikrat, Guru Raj and Sujay Shanbagh. Srivandram, Hyderabad, Kolkata, Mumbai all have male dancers but soloists who have some name and outreach nationally. Small town India is more committed sometimes. Baroda, Mysore, Ahmedabad try hard but get no or few opportunities. There are few potential ones like Sinmam Basu Singh in Manipuri of Kolkata or Anuj Mishra of Lucknow. Unlike in Western dance culture, especially classical ballet, where the body was all important and had to be perfect shape and size, in Indian classical forms, weight or age was never an issue and continues to be Western classical dance ballerinas were selected after a very, very tight process of assessment where every ounce of body weight was measured. Women dancers in India have had many freedoms, weight, height, age, add talent and training. Another important aspect of body and art is that all earlier dancers who popularized Indian classical dances and traveled worldwide were mostly males. Ram Gopal, Uday Shankar, Guru Gopinath, Anand Shivram and so were the gurus, all men. Minakshi Sundaram Pillai, Muthukumaran Pillai, Kunju Kurup, Amobi Singh, the list is long and endless. There was not a single woman dancer individual pre-1940s and all gurus were males. It is amazing how this fact is submerged in post-independent India's history. Most young male star soloists like Ram and Uday Shankar came from pedigreed backgrounds, educated and well healed. A decade later, in 1930s, the educated, exposed to foreign culture ladies too started taking to dance. The Rukmini Devis, the Minali Sarabhais and the Madam Menakas. Then Shantarao, Indrani Rahman and Jhaveri sisters. The equation shifted as these women were empowered by education and had families of pelp and power backing them. They also won ready acclaim in audiences as so few women dancers those days. This was a social change in 1940s when even Brahmin girls whose family long shunned temple devdasis or rajdasi arts took to dance and 1950 onwards there were more and more examples. 1960 onwards, the new lot of smart, educated city talents like Sonal Man Singh's, Padma Subramaniam, Zuma Sharma's took to these traditional arts and showcased these classical styles. They brought with them a new approach and attitude to arts. The age of women power was complete in the 80s when very few male dancers were left and slowly even teachers were all females. In less than 50 years, such sweeping historical change took place. Two or three exceptions abound all through, Indrani Rahman, M.K. Saroja, Yamini Krishnamurti. They remained outside all paradigms and purviews because of a very strong foundation, some Shastric scholarship and genuine appreciation by Rasikas. Later in the younger generation, only Alarmel Valli and Malvika Sarukai showed this trait. Fast forward to now, age, Indian dance does need some quality check. It is now odd to see an old dancer without much talent or substance trying to look great. Bala was great, Rukmini was a pioneer, Minalni created an institution in wilderness of a desert city, Yamni sparkled like a polished diamond, Vajanti Mala and Padma made film dance come alive on stage, Sonal brought debate to dance, but today we see some dancers just trying to position themselves as great without having the content or the context. 
they are overweight and obese and have no business to be on stage because their art also does not touch one's heart or soul. They don't have the content and materials the elders have. Just reviving an old Andhra form already worked at by seasoned authorities or shifting base from one city to another would not help shift body weight. Some of such dancers are an insult to Indian classical forms where even the Natya Shastra prescribed exact height, proportions and features suited to dance on Natya. Abhinaya ability comes with experience and with age it can mellow. No one can teach Abhinaya in two week workshops. These are precisely that workshops. Those who started this trend did singular disservice to Indian classical dance. Can a Kalamandalam Gopis or Amakuti Asan's art be learnt in two weeks? Bharatanatyam has fallen prey to many shortcuts because all are in a hurry. The teacher to earn some dollars, the student to perform, in all this craze to be successful, the quality of art is lost. What is needed today is very strict quality check and who can ensure that? A guru who is in the market to earn? Earlier gurus were not in the market. They were not even interested in money. Guru Motukumaran Pillai of Kattumanar Koil Chidambaram bought veshtis for village boys from his own money and students like Ramya Pillai, Kunchida Padam Pillai and Muthuswami Pillai from his own monies and sent them his best students to earn name and fame in Madras once he left Madras. Guru Shambhu Maharaj could not count beyond 100 rupees, although in dance, in his art of Kathak, he could create any mathematical combination of footwork or permutation. It is today important that dancers leave an everlasting impression on youngsters, as else neither will there be a real audience or rasikas. Second generation critics have failed miserably in the decades 70s to 90s when mediocrity set in. Most dance critics came from non-dance backgrounds, some were retired government clerks, some from accounting and some from films or music. Critics are like dentists or jewelers. They cannot be private PR agents, as some unscrupulous ones have become. No wonder Indian dance quality suffered overall in last 30 years. The earlier great critics were gone, those who helped revive and save our forms. Today it is far worse. The under 25 journalist cares two hoots for anything Indian, leave alone dance or music. And one interviewer asked me the difference between opera and opera, Winfrey. <clears throat> Yet in all darkness, efforts continue abroad and it is in Singapore or Seattle, Paris or Pittsburgh that the seed that made Indian traditional arts great may be saved in some dance lab and germinate properly in coming years and flower and blossom to find specimens of dance. Maybe out of India, away from pulls and pressures of patronage and bureaucrats, some sense of discipline and quality survives. <clears throat> away from motherland, many Indians are trying to foster dance and music arts as they had seen it and learnt it. That may well be the saving grace. On that happy note, let's hope Indian dance art continues to be ageless. As India's only real prima donna Yamri Krishnamurti philosophically said, my art is ageless because I am a creative person. I have many lives in me. Each time a new idea comes, new energy flows in. Thus, art is ageless. Only three dancers gave up dancing on stage when age knocked on their doors, Indrani Rahman, M.K. Saroja and Yamni Krishnamurti. Them we salute and their art will be remembered for long.